Cool. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Jason's Take On podcast series. Uh, this is episode 22. I can't believe we've nearly been doing it for two years, Jason. It's incredible. <laughs> Crazy. Um, today on this episode, myself, Jason Noble, based here in London, and my girl partner, Jason Whitehead, based over in the sunny US of A, um, we're going to talk about does customer success mean anything to your customers? I think it's a really key question to ask. A lot of the challenges you have um, when you come into the roles, you come into organizations, and what, what does it mean to your customers? Right? And if your customers don't understand it, there's lots of challenges that come as a result of that. So we're going to give you some thoughts about that, um, talk through why, why we're talking about it, give you a bit more insight into it, and kind of come up some with insights and some actions that you can take from that. Uh, a few quick introductions and reminders. So myself, Jason Noble, based over here in London, uh, been in the customer success space now for a bit too long, uh, been in the technology space for even longer, uh, but a lot of what I do is I'm focusing on helping businesses become more customer centric. Currently the VP of customer success for an uh, organization called Vinley in the exciting world of connected cars, helping them build and drive their customer success with our customers. Um, and then partner Jason Whitehead, quick intro from you, Jason. Yep. Hi everyone. My name is Jason Whitehead based here in the Washington DC area. I've been working in the customer success and software user adoption and change management area for, you know, over 20 plus years. And it's been really fun to, to uh, work with both customers and, um, and software suppliers to help bring the two together. So offer a variety of co consulting, coaching, training, all kinds of great services and have an exciting new service getting ready to launch in about a month and a half that we'll be talking about more very soon. So thanks very much. Uh, back to you, Jason. Really cool. And really, we'll, we'll, we'll have a conversation about that, that upcoming new initiative from you guys, Jason. I think that's a really good thing to talk about. Uh, but, but as always... What we're trying to do is kind of give some insights and ideas around some key areas and topics in customer success that we've been discussing. Um, really a flowing conversation. Uh, please do come back with any questions, any thoughts you've got on this. We do have a, a LinkedIn page and do follow us on Twitter. Um, what we always like to do as part of these podcasts as well is have what we call a bold question, a bold challenge question, sorry. Um, and the bold challenge question for day, today is what bold action can you take to make sure that your customers know what you are there to do and why it's important for their success, the you being your customer success team. So have a think about that. We'll revisit it at the end, but we'd really like some ideas. So please do post on our LinkedIn group on Twitter. But what, what are you guys doing um, around helping your customers let them know why you're there? Uh, so Jason, I'll let you, do you want to get started on kind of talking yeah. about the question? Yeah, thanks for uh, that intro and kicking us off. So the, again, the topic today is, does customer, customer success really mean anything to your customers? And what we like to do is to start off with a bit of context. So Jason, um, to get us going here, why are we even talking about this topic and why is it so important? I think it's, a, it's, it's one of those really big topics and you almost ask yourself, why are we asking this? Surely, surely we know, our customers know, but, but in actual fact, the customers often don't. And I, there's many organizations I've worked with where when you talk to your customers, they actually don't understand it. They think you're sales, they think you're support, they're not quite sure what you're there to do. So I think it's really important to make sure that you are getting the message across to your customers as to what you're there to do and, and to getting to understand the whole reason that we have customer success, the reason why these teams, these departments are created. And it's, it's ultimately because our customers are generally not, not good at getting the value on their own, using our products in their organizations. And we want to help them get that value and get it quicker. Um, and many customers are often not focused on what they need to do in their organization to achieve success. And that might sound a bit daft, but it's true. Mm -hmm. right? and what, what we want to do is how do we make sure that different customers, the stakeholders that we're talking to, get them to care about their long-term success and really articulate what that means for them. And how do we then get them to take the actions necessary to achieve it? And I think quite often people don't know this. And unless someone's asking it, them, it really doesn't come into their day-to-day -day way of thinking. A lot of people get really caught up in the weeds and think very tactically and operationally. I think you've also got to have a look at the kind of big picture issue here. You know, we, we need to make sure that we're taking actions to ensure that everybody in the customer's organization um, are both aware of and motivated by and to take the correct actions to drive success for everybody in their own organization. You know, what makes these individuals we're speaking to successful in their own right how does that success contribute to their organization? And what does success look like for their organization? Do they all know about it? Yeah. One of the other challenges we often have, and we've spoken about this before quite a few times actually, is about 
multiple stakeholders. You, you know, success means different things to different stakeholders. If I'm a buyer of software, how does this purchase contribute to my organization's success compared to from a user? Am I aware of how using this software, using these services contribute to my success and then contribute to the organization's success? And there's two very different dimensions to it there. And I don't think that all stakeholders are always aware of what the different stakeholders own success looks like. So that you might have people that are actually working against each other, almost in silos within an organization. It's important to get them to understand that. I think you've also got to have ultimately different success criteria at different levels for your different stakeholders. That's something that's really important to work with your customers to get them to understand that and be able to document what they look like. You've also got a lot of people in an organization that are, are very happy to just ultimately plod along with the way things are. They've got very little, very little interest in changing, little awareness of how what they do impacts the bigger organization, how, how it impacts the overall organization's success. They just want to do their jobs. And now there's, there's nothing wrong with that. We need those people in the organizations. But, but where does that fit in to custom success you know how do we make sure that they're aware and as motivated as others as the need to change if you're asking someone to go through a big change program how do you make sure that everybody in that is part of that change program i was only today i was just speaking to jason earlier on but i had a conversation with one of my customers contacts today and they were talking about change management as a big challenge for them as part of their customer advisory boards and it is something that we've spoke about before, but it's something that is really pertinent all the way through an organization. I think the other thing you've got to do is look at how do you align incentives and rewards in an organization yep, really to, to make sure that it's in everyone's best interest to change how people use the technology and, and take advantage of it or get value from it. So I think there's a lot of different dimensions to that. And it's really, really a complex topic. Um, and I think the more the more that you and I talked about this the other day, Jason, the more we realized that there's actually a lot of stuff to talk about here. Another question I'll throw back to you, though, is what what are the reasons that we see that more and more customers are not aware of the need for customer success? Um, and what are the actions required to achieve it? Yeah, you know, I, I really love what you're saying, too, about people just not being aware and different role conflicts and that thing. So I want to want to take a look at this from two perspectives. Um, I think the first area is, What's going on internally to their customer's own organization? And, and what are the things there that are contributing to the lack of awareness, lack of understanding? And then also I want to take a look at externally, like as a supplier, as a vendor, how is it, what are the actions we're taking that are influencing our customers or, or in this case, not influencing them uh, to make them aware of where it needs to go? So, so I think starting first, like if you're internally in your customer's organization, and when you look at that, you know, I think a lot depends on the, the culture and the size of their organization. And a lot of people, um, you know, they're really only aware of, their role and their team of what it is that they're supposed to do with the software and sometimes not even that. But I think this is especially true with those junior levels where you know, people just a year or two out of, out, of, out of college or school and they really don't have the experience or awareness um, or even the internal, vis uh, internal visibility to really understand what does success look like and what are we trying to achieve here. So, you know, they're not always aware of it for a variety of reasons and they therefore don't really understand why they're working towards success and why it's so important. And I think you're also taking a step back and looking historically, you know, a lot of technologies and a lot of technology initiatives have been driven by really IT focused people or tech focused people. And they, they really focus on, on the software, on the tool, on the features and the functions. You know, and they get really excited about how cool the system is. And, and you know, as a bit of a technique myself, it's like, all right, this is very cool. But they don't always focus on the impact on the people, their behaviors and the organization, more of the technology for technology's sake. And, and with that is sort of, historically been the driver of a lot of technology implementations and initiatives, it's hard to really see that larger success goal from that perspective. But I, I do think also, um, you know, fundamentally, technology is about enabling different behaviors and processes of the people. And it's not just about the, the system for the sake of the system. I think people lose sight of that. You know, and then I've worked with a lot of executives over the years, a lot of leaders and organizations. And so many times it's still, and so many times even today, it still surprises me that people just expect people to do something just because they say it and they say it once, you know, oh, well, um, we're just gonna tell them that using the systems is required and that's all we need to do for change and effort. And a lot of leaders, they're not used to actually having to spend time and effort to think about the change process and about how to drive change and especially how to do it at scale. And I think it's really critical as the leadership team is, is lacking the awareness and understanding of 
how change and adoption and getting value from technology doesn't happen organically. It requires concerted effort and programs and resources, especially at a large organization, but to do it consistently, effectively at scale, you need to de develop that to that. And they're not used to having to do this. You know, and Jason, I think one of the things that, that you, you and I talked about quite a bit and, and that you've mentioned a lot in the past has been, there's just so many internal silos in businesses. And, and as part of you know, each silo or each department, may, the leaders might have their own goals and their own objectives. And they might be too focused just on their silo and, and what's their particular goal or their metrics, especially if it's part of their incentive plan, that they're not looking at the bigger picture to the overall business success and the overall business goals. And I think that's, that's a real driver for why people just um, are not really aware of these actions and, and the need for success. And, and that's from the internal perspective. I think that last one, Jace, is a really big one. You're right. I mean, mm -hmm. it, is, it is something that every organization struggles with to different degrees. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I, I haven't seen a lot of dramatic improvements in that area. I, I think people acknowledge the, that, but they don't devote yeah. the time to solving yeah. that and, and how to get there. You know, but now let's also take a step back from the external perspective. As a vendor, as a supplier, what is it that we're doing or not doing to influence our customers and to get them to perceive the value of customer success, understand the need for it, and be willing to, to participate? And a lot of teams, you know, we work with a lot of customer success teams, you know, training on developing their, their processes and tools. And we look at so many of them, and the first time they're engaging with customers around customer success, um, you know, the customers don't always know why it's important. They think it's just another line of support or an extension of sales. You're not quite sure who are these teams and, and why are you talking to me now? And when we take a step back, we look at it that not many sales teams really introduce the CS function or individuals or team properly. You know, it's often not part of their sales pitch. Um, you know, as you get the sales handover, you know, and, and you're sort of just chucked across here. Uh, but the customer people don't always know who you are, what you're there to do. And the assumption is that you're just part of some sort of white glove support service. And I think that really doesn't set the CS team up to to really be effective and it certainly doesn't set the customers up to use them um, to really drive your own success. Uh, you know, and I think another piece here is it, when you look at customer success as an industry, you know, or as a, as, a, as a service focus, it's still very new to both suppliers and customers. And when you look across vendors, there's such a wide range of CS services. And, and so customers that have multiple vendors, which is pretty much every customer out there, they don't really have a clear, consistent sense of what each vendor will provide, and why it's important and the value it will bring to them. So I think since they have such different experiences and expectations around what customer success means, you as a supplier and as the vendor, you need to be very careful and you need to be very explicit in how you set these expectations and how you use these expectations to help drive the customer to take the actions that will ultimately lead to their and your success. So I think there's a lot of things that are like right out of the gate you're seeing. It's, there's problems in, in terms of the customers and Many times suppliers are not really addressing those effectively from the beginning, not setting those right expectations. Um, so those are just some of my thoughts. Uh, I've done a few of any others, or, or uh, if not, if you want to go ahead and move on to the next question here. I, I think, you know, that I, I like the way you've split it out into kind of the internal and external reasons. And I think it's really important to differentiate the two because there are two very different sets of reasons then that you can put actions against each to then address and, and kind of mm -hmm. work with your customers on those. And I like that differentiation there. As I yeah, said, right. I think that the last one about the kind of silos as well is such, such a big one. And, and I think, I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said it's something that we're not, people are aware of it, but we're not seeing a rapid enough change yet. Yeah. And it's, I, mean, I, I, I remember, you know, when you and I first met, you know, we were talking about it then. That's a couple of years back, and it's, it's <laughs> challenges that that haven't yet haven't yet really come to the the forefront of what organisations are doing. It's starting to happen, but really, really slowly. And I'd just like to see some of these changes happen a lot quicker. I, I think we all would too. And I, I know the silo thing is is uh, one in which you are particularly passionate. Yeah. But but moving on here, then. Um, so Jason, tell me, you know, what are the risks if we don't get this right? And you know, what are the risks for our customers? What are the risks for us? Why? You know, what do we stand to lose here? I, I think that the, the big risk for all of this is if you don't do this right, you just lose that, that long-term engagement. You know, and ultimately what that does is then presents a renewal risk. Um, I, and I think the, the big picture here, though, is this isn't a customer success team risk. It isn't a customer success function risk. These are actually business risks. You know, if our customers, if there's a renewal risk and retention risk, that impacts the whole business and it has all 
kind of follow on risks associated with it. You know, customers leaving because they're not getting the results they want. They ultimately become social detractors, making it harder for us to get new sales. We don't get the advocacy we want from them. And I think that's really important to realize that the risks here are not just around our customer success team right? and that they are big picture business risks. I think the, the risk for our customers is, is ultimately that they've, they've come to us because they've got an underlying business problem um, that, that they want to resolve and they're looking for us to, to help them fix a, and, and address for it. And ultimately, by failing with us where we're not solving that problem, it extends the length of time and effort and ultimately money they're spending solving the underlying issue. So it can have a big commercial impact on them as well. Mm -hmm. I think for, for us as service providers, as vendors, we're ultimately not delivering mutual, mutual success, mutual, I've made a word up there, <laughs> M mutual success. And our, our customers won't, won't be and can't be successful. And, and, and ultimately then we're not successful. I think that mutual success is something that's so, so, so important. And, and ultimately, the, the, there's a bigger market risk then that if, if we can't solve these problems, but our competitors can, that introduces huge different elements of risk there. You know, if our customers can do that, or if our competitors, sorry, can do this, they can deliver success. You know, they, this quickly develop market situations where they become the better and safer supplier. And, and we, we have a reputation for not delivering success and value. And there's a competition, competitive risk then around that. And I think what, what you find is that, that ultimately suppliers are working more and more on their proven ability to deliver value and competing on that ability. And it's important to keep that momentum going. You know, every time you fail to deliver that value and fail to deliver success to your customers, that, that's a, a black mark against you ultimately. Yes, there are times when there are external factors, but they're all... Every time there's something you can do to help turn it around or not be presented with that situation in the first place. So I think that the key thing here is there are, at first it might seem relatively small and isolated and even siloed risks, but, but they're not. These are significant business risks that impact you, they impact your customer, and they can have a much longer impact on you rather than just straight away. And I think that's something that is so critical that this really can have a significant impact on our business and our customers business yeah i think you know, I, I really love what you were saying there about the um the, the competitive risk and i think that's more and more we're going to see suppliers or, or customers buying on who has the best track record of delivering outcomes to customers even if they have less features and functions in the product that they that also means that yeah. customer perceives and get more value you know, I'm reminded of the old saying, you know, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. I think in the future, it's going to be, you know, no one's ever going to get fired for buying the company with a proven track record of delivering value, even if it's a less robust system. And, and it's a great example of that because mm -hmm. IBM were there known for delivering value and brand reputation. You know, you knew who they were and they had a part of that. Is that, is that market competitive? They're, they're known for what they can deliver. Right, and by you know, people want to work with them because of who they are and that recognition. I think it's really important. Yep. Thing on that, we, thirty years later, still coasting on that. It, 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 absolutely, and they're still a significant organization. You know, and these yep. are things that, that do last. I think we've we've talked about kind of the reasons for for this conversation, the challenges here. We've talked about the risks. Um, what I'd like to look at now, Jason, I'll throw this one back to you: is why, you know, why, why do we? why do we need to do this? You know, what are the actions that we need to take? Yeah. What are the, what are the actions we need to make customers aware of for customer success in its role and its value and what it brings to them? You know, and I, I think that's the challenge for so many organizations is figuring out, so what do we do about it? And, yep. and people are constantly talking about that. So, you know, taking this from the, again, the perspective of the, the vendor of the supplier, I think there's two areas that what do they need to do internally to align their teams since it, it so customer success is more than just a department, and I believe we covered that in previous podcasts, so you know, if you haven't listened to that one, go check it out. Um, but then I think there's also what do they need to do when engaging externally with prospects and customers, and so I'm sort of looking from both angles. Uh, I think the first thing here is that, you know, the idea of customer success and delivering on value really needs to be baked into the entire company and the entire vision and the whole philosophy of, of, and ways of working. Everyone across the entire organization needs to be focused on delivering customer value and customer outcomes, not, not as focused on delivering customer uh, software, the best widget 
or that's best featured function, but really delivering outcomes to the customer. And I think to get there, you know, you need a couple of things. And the first one is you really do need a strong CS leader, someone who has a strong vision for what success looks like and and a strong vision for what success looks like from the customer perspective and then the ability to work backwards from there to say, how do we get there and what needs to happen in our organization and with how we engage our customers. And I think this, this CS leader, they need to be a really solid executive that can uh, influence the other executives in the organization, the other C-suite. So they've got to be able to influence the CEO to help them understand why this is so important, maybe even and be able to influence the board and really drive some alignment around there. And I think if you have that strong CS leader, they need to be cultivating this, the CEO and drive in championing this as well too, because this is beyond just the scope of customer success. It really does need to come from the top of that CEO and the board level around that. And they need to trickle it down um, business-wide. So the CEO needs to be the one saying, hey, we need to have sales and marketing and product and, and support all aligned on driving success. We can't just leave it to the CS team. And you know, they can't just give a slip service and they can't just delegate it to the CS team to handle it. because that, That's gonna be a sure, sure recipe for disaster. And I think from there you need to really look and say, how do they, how do we get that more internal engagement that we need across the sales and marketing teams so that everyone understands why it's so important for their business and they understand what needs to, to happen to make sure that, that, you know, quote unquote, what is CS or what CS is, is built into all communications, all plans, all marketing, all materials that we deliver. Um, so that we're fully aligned as a company around this concept of delivering value to customers. So I think that's the first thing around the internal alignment is, is really focused there. And I believe in the past, you know, Jason, we've talked about the need as a CS leader to spend a third of your time with customers, a third of your time with your CS team and growing them, and a third of your time doing that internal alignment. Yep, and I think, absolutely. I, think I, I always talk about the three, three types of customers there. And I think it's mm -hmm. a really key thing to remember that. And then sort of shifting focus in terms of what else we should do. I think we really need to look at how we engage from prospects and customers um, throughout every stage of, of the life cycle, every stage of the journey. And this really does come back to um, all of our messaging and position for marketing and sales, you know, before the customer even has their first discussion with a salesperson, before their first time they experience all the way through, it needs to be focused on outcomes and results for the customer and from the customer's point of view and how we as an organization do everything to deliver those. It can't be just focused on the product or just focused on the service you deliver. And I think, you know, then we need to really make this a whole area, make this the area where we compete, as we talked about. You know, we're not competing on, on features and functions, we're competing on our ability to solve business problems and to help customers take actions beyond the technology that will deliver their own success. And, if, and that's, that's going to be the battleground, I think. We also need to demonstrate to customers all the way through why customer success services are so critical to helping the customer achieve their success and why the customer should engage with, with our CS teams and with other, other folks and really use this as a differentiator in our, in our marketing and sales effort. If you have a really, really strong, impactful customer success program, customer success team that, that can demonstrate and prove the value they're delivering to customers, that's a huge differentiator from a sales perspective. That should help you close deals faster and easier if you use that, that great tool the right way. And I think, you know, as part of that, focusing the customer on all the challenges that the customer needs to address internally in their organization so that the customer can drive change and adoption and the customer can focus on how they're gonna get value from your technology. Or, or, or not just from your technology, but really focuses on any technology and help them realize that it's not just specific to your product or service, but any product that they purchase will require these types of efforts on the customer's part. And once you get the customer to understand that, then you can go and demonstrate how your organization as the supplier, as the vendor, is fully aligned to help them through this process and that you have the services and you have the resources and that you offer them the support that they need so that they can drive success using your product or service in their organization. So I think that's, that's a really powerful thing. And, and then, you know, I also think, you know, you get um, bonus points if you can also show how you've sort of built this mindset and this functionality in, into your product or support so that it's sort of product-led success, driving that change and adoption within your product. And you know, shout out to our friend, Dave Jackson, who uh, joined us for a, a podcast here on product-led customer success. I think that he really had some great ideas about how you do that. So it's both how you act as a customer, or as a vendor and supplier to help your customer navigate the journey, as well as what you bake into your services, as well as yep. how you align your product with that. So those are, those are some of my thoughts. Any, anything you'd add or 
I no, I, I think that 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 last one is kind of a, a future direction and trend that you've seen as well. The idea of product led success you know, is how do we how do we kind of not not automate this, but but make customers kind of more self sufficient as to how they achieve it themselves mm-hmm. right? and can do it with the product. And I think that's something we're going to see more and more concrete examples of. Yeah. So so I. I sort of the next step from this sort of logically comes once the customer understands the need for customer success and they sort of get it about, you know, why, what your customer success team does and where they go, um, what should you be doing? What should we be doing to help the customer to do more to achieve success on their own in their organization? What action should we be driving them to take? It's almost the, the holy grail of this, isn't it? When you've got the customer <laughs> being successful, you've delivered your product. They are, is it, is it going back to that, that dream that we always had that our product would just deliver success without us doing anything? I think there are, there are, you know, it's where we want to get to. And I think leading on from that point about product led customer success, you know, there are things that we can do, can do, sorry. And I think, you know, ultimately, if we assume that part of the issue is the customers don't understand the need for it, or that perhaps they lack some of the experience, the resources internally to drive their own success, then what we need to do is look at how can we help them become more self-sufficient in these areas to achieve it on their own. Mm-hmm. You know, and part of what we're doing also is helping them change their mindsets and to thinking differently. It's this change management aspect. It's not just about using a tool. It's doing things differently. And some of this doing things differently might be behavior that they've had ingrained in them for a long time. And that piece can take a long time. Um, and I think it's also for many, it's understanding what, what success looks like and what outcomes they want. That can be really challenging. So the, the quicker and the quicker you can identify what success is and what the outcomes are, and the better you can articulate those and, and get a customer to kind of repeat that back and understand that and then see how they can relate that back to the product, the clearer the path comes for them. And I think for, for many, the, the big challenge, you know, it really is think about how you relate your, your customer success, how you see customer success for them in their roles. And, and you can also kind of go about mirror you know, these mirroring techniques, using phrases and words that mean something to them. So rather than come in and start talking to them about terms that have come from you as a vendor, you as a supplier, or, or even words and phrases that you might know from the industry, listen to what your customer is saying. What's the, the kind of commentary they use? What's their vocabulary? What are the key words for them? And how do you change what your outcomes are, what the outcomes they want are, and what success goals and criteria are? How do you put it in their own terms, their own language? I think that then allows them to relate to it a lot, lot better. And it can take a long time. You know, you've got to really help coach your customers through that. I think one of the things you can absolutely do is provide them with case studies, white papers that really show how you've helped other customers and other organizations achieve success and how these other customers have understood what value is that's been provided. And that's something that I've seen great success within a number of organizations I've been working with, where we've worked with the marketing teams, really got some resources around customer marketing as opposed to new business marketing, you know, help drive that success for your existing customers, but, but present case studies, use your existing customers as advocates, and it can be really powerful there to help drive new business. Um, I think the other the other, you, you talked about kind of a, an old phrase there, but there is the old one about teach once you've taught a man how to fish. You know, focus your customer success efforts on building your customer's capacity to drive user adoption and success on their own. So teach your customer to fish and they'll then go and fish for themselves. You know, give them the knowledge, the tools they need to be more self-sufficient. Some of this may require training. It may require kind of professional services. But once you do this, there are two really key things that happen. Firstly, it reduces the need and demand for extensive customer success effort and resources from you. This lowers your cost of service um, and then your cost to retain the business. And it allows you also to focus your customer success effort and program then on more value driven activities like building capacity, growing the customer base, looking at cross sell opportunities. How do you expand within the customer Mm -hmm. and looking at new functions, new services, new ways of delivering value instead of focusing on those low value added efforts and ultimately then allows you to be more scalable. So that's the first point. The second one is it really empowers the customers to drive, achieve and sustain 
much, much higher levels of success in their own organizations than, than they on their own, or even you would, would have considered in that first engagement that would have been achievable or possible. And I really think, you, you know, that the more success they achieve, the greater that success can become. And the more success they achieve, the less effort and, and work that you put into it. So it's almost a, a very positive kind of cycle here. The more you put in initially and work you put in to get them to achieve success really has a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy about it. And they ultimately become a lot more successful. So I think there's some really key things to talk about there. Well, what I kind of build onto that, Jason, and I'll throw this one back to you, is how do we, how do you then focus these conversations? You know, I talked about changing the conversations and mirroring some of the words, but how do you focus your customers' conversations and actions on, on achieving this mutual success? What are some of the things that we can do? You know, that's one that comes up all the time when we're, we're training classes, training individuals and in, in how to do this. And I, it, it amazes me how uncomfortable people are having just direct conversations and doing it in a way that builds trust between the supplier and the customer when it's the simplest thing to do once you just get used to it. Um, so I think, you know, sort of similar to, to what you said in the last question, is using the customer's language to help relate to their normal conversation and their ways of working. So you make sure you're speaking their language, first of all, is, is very, very important. Um, and I think being honest and transparent with the customers, um, you know, avoid over-servicing -serv and, you know, and let them know what you can do and what you can't do. But I think it's really important is that um, you need to make sure your customers are really focused on mutual success and understand what's right from the very, very beginning. And they understand what success means for them and what it means for you. Uh, so I think that's a challenge for a lot of folks. And especially for more junior team members in the CSM, they're probably less comfortable having these conversations. They don't necessarily know how to do that. So was, you know, some of the things that I recommend is that you know, be very clear and direct right from the start and just have a direct conversation. That's all this is with folks here. And for some reason, people struggle with this. Uh, and, and they're afraid to talk about your, their needs as well as the customer's needs. They're afraid to talk about how you both achieve success and how you both need to work together through this process. And when people are afraid to discuss this or they him and haw and they're just not clear about it, they actually create their own elephant in the room situation. And it's artificial and it doesn't need to be there. It's, it's, it's frustrating to watch it happen because it makes it harder for you and it makes it harder for your customers. So let's just you know dispel a couple of myths right here. You know, First of all, it will come as absolutely no surprise to your customers that you want them to renew. It will come as absolutely no surprise to your customer that you're gonna want them to buy more. And it's gonna come as absolutely no surprise to your customer that you wanna have them stay with you for 20 years or more, that once you have them, you're gonna want them to stick around. So just talk about it right up front and just have that conversation because they already know it and you already know it. And when you're afraid to talk about it, you, you sort of break down trust before it's even built. So I think when you, when you do this, when you talk about it, you set a clear expectation and ultimately you build a trust because you're explicit about your goals and motivations and you talk about theirs. And they're not spending time for a hidden agenda, it's all on the table and you can just discuss it like adults. You know, so, so one of the easiest ways to do this very early in your, in your customer relationship, whether it's in sales or onboarding or even multiple times depending on the different groups, is just say to them, say, look, it's gonna come as no surprise that we wanna have you as a customer for 20 years or more. And we know that the only way that this is going to happen is if you get so much value from using our products and services, that you're going to want to renew and you're going to want to expand your account with us. And we're here, here to help you get that value so you do both and that you benefit year over year. And then you can continue on the conversation to say, look, of course, to make this happen, we're going to need to do some, to work closely with you and we're going to need to do some things and you're going to need to do some things too. So let's just approach this relationship as a close partnership and let's just discuss right up front and on an ongoing basis, you know, what is it we both need to do to achieve our mutual success goals? You know, and, and, and it's pretty easy to do. And just having that conversation paves the way for an honest discussion about where, where you're going to go and how you're both going to get there. And I think there is one caveat that I, I want to call out to folks though, is as you're having these discussions, and this is very, very important, you know, you are a partner with your, with your customer. You got your, your success and their success is, and extractively linked because it's all connected here. But remember that your customer needs to achieve success and clear measurable value and their success has to come before your success. Their success has to happen before they will renew and they have to perceive value before they're going to renew. They need to achieve clear value before they're going to expand. And they need to perceive this value as well too. So while you approach this as a partnership and a partnership of equals, I think you need to understand that 
you need to focus on helping the customer achieve their goals in order for them to help you achieve your goals. I think that's pretty critical. So those are some, some of my thoughts on that. Uh, what would you add to that? I, I think that the, the point that you've, you've covered there that really resonates with me is how you've got to be very clear and direct from the start. And I, and I think there are, I've seen this so many times where the customer success team is introduced, but, but they find it very difficult to articulate what, what they're there to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, and, and also they, they, you know, and what success means to them. And I love the way that you've said, you know, it's obvious to our customers that, that we want them to renew with us. If, yeah. if it's not, if, if it's not obvious, you've, you've got a real problem there. So, so you, you, you talk as well, you've mentioned the word partnership a few times and it's something that I, it, I, I use that more and more in my vocabulary. And I think it is that the word partner, it implies you're in it together. And, yep. and it's not it's not supplier and customer, vendor and customer or client. It's partners. You're partners in this together. And I think mm -hmm. that's that again can often require a mind shift change for us as as the technology providers to realize that that we are partners. You know, this is a two way thing. And I, and I think that's something that I've, there's a lot of what we've talked about is getting our our customers to understand that this is about mutual success. But we've you got know, to make sure that we. In, in our organizations do that our sales guys do our technical guys do we do everybody does that this is this is about everybody's mutual success and the more success either party has in this the better this is going to become and i think that's one of the really key things so i think for me as i said that the points you've made around kind of making it obvious up front even though it should be already that, that guys we've got a three-year contract here but we want to renew but but also consider them as partners and it is something that really changes the way that you think about these relationships. You know, that, that's so true. And, and what we just talked about too, it's so, it's an easy skill to learn. And I was recently um, delivering a training course to a company that great folks and, and several of the people were new to the role and, and new to the career. And they were a little nervous about how to have these conversations. Yeah. So we did a role play and they, they did it the way they normally do. Then I, I went through and I did a role play to model the way it could be done. And then a little bit later, they came back and role played again. And just to see the growth in their confidence and the growth in their comfort having these conversations over just a couple of days, it's, it's amazing. And then you know, when I follow up with them later, hearing back from their managers and from themselves, how much better their customers reacted, how much better the engagement was. Yep. Uh, all of this stuff is easily addressed. It just takes a little time to, to think about it and to practice and everyone gets it. So that, that's it. that excites me is seeing people. But I, I think the key thing there as well is this, is this is part of the success of this is once you do yes. coach people and as a CS leader, you know, or a leader in an organization, part of your role is there to coach and help your team, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to remove those blockers. And if you can show them how to deliver more value like this, it really sets you up for great success. I think. Absolutely. I think guys, that, that's, that's, that's the conversation. Um, really, really hope you enjoyed it. Jason and I love these conversations. As I said at the beginning, I cannot believe we're coming up for two years of these. We, we've got some more great ones planned over the coming months um, and some great guest speakers coming up, um, some true global conversations that we're going to be having over the next coming months. But please do any feedback. We'd love to have it. But do if you could recommend anyone for any guests, if there's any topics you'd like us to talk about, do let us know. But just before we close, kind of a recap as to what the kind of bold challenge question we presented at the beginning was, what bold action can you take to make sure that your customers know what you, the customer success team, are there to do and why it's so important for their success? So please do have a think about that. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation. A, a big thank you from myself and goodbye from Jason here in the UK. Great. And thank you for me as well, too. Goodbye from Washington, D.C. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.